first episode of Warlord Worlds, a fan podcast devoted to the comic creations of writer and artist Mike Grell, including Warlord, John Sable, Star Slayer, and Green Arrow. I'm Darren. And I'm Ruth. And this is a fan podcast. We're not affiliated with Mike Grell, and the opinions expressed are just ours. We're doing this podcast simply because we enjoy reading and talking about the comics of Mike Grell. You're probably wondering a little about our title. We chose Warlord Worlds because we want to cover the many worlds created by Mike Grell, including Warlord John Sable, Star Slayer, and Green Arrow. So we envisioned Mike Grell himself as the Warlord over all those worlds, and that's where the title Warlord Worlds comes from. We mentioned that we plan to cover several of Mike Grell's series, and most of those series had lengthy runs, so there are many issues to cover. Sadly, real life gets in the way of reading comics and recording podcasts, so if we tried to cover one issue per episode, we'd never finish. For that reason, we're going to take a high-level overview-style look at multiple issues in each episode. That should keep the show fast-paced and let us cover large amounts of material each time. Also, since there is such diversity in the various series, we know that some of you will be fans of some titles but not others, so we're going to cover multiple titles in each episode. We'll vary the number of issues covered in each episode based on how story arcs fall in the books. For instance, in this first episode... We're planning to cover the initial appearance of Warlord in the first special, as well as Warlord issues 1 through 4. We'll then cover John Sable issues 1 and 2, and Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters. Of course, some of you will be thinking that Mike Grell didn't create Green Arrow, and that is true, but you could argue that Mike Grell reinvented Green Arrow for a modern audience with the Longbow Hunters miniseries in 1987, and with the 80-issue run he had in the monthly Green Arrow comic from 1988 to 1994. Mike Grell put Green Arrow in a hood and turned him into an urban hunter in the late 1980s, and that is the most prominent version of the character still seen today, even in the Arrow TV series. In fact, in the Arrow TV series, we've heard references to Judge Grell, we've seen the character Shadow, which Mike Grell did create, and throughout the first season, the police sketch of Arrow was drawn by Mike Grell. Before we get started, we'll mention that we have had the pleasure to meet Mike Grell at conventions on several occasions over the last few years. He's a real gentleman and certainly appreciates his fans. If you ever have a chance to meet him at a con, we encourage you to do so. He always has a great selection of prints for sale and is always happy to sign comics. In addition, he does amazing commissions at reasonable prices. If you are a fan of Mike Grell, which we assume you are since you are listening to this, then there are a few other resources that we recommend. First, check out MikeGrell.com, which is his official site where he posts upcoming convention appearances as well as occasional news updates. If you are on Facebook, check out the excellent Mike Grell page run by Gus Ceballos. Catskill Comics is the official representative for Mike Grell for commissions, so if you aren't able to see him at a convention, you can contact them for pricing and other details. There are a few other podcasts that you might also enjoy. Professor Allen at the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network is a Mike Grell fan and occasionally covers various Mike Grell comics on his many podcasts. Jeff Messer at the Geek Brain Podcast is another Mike Grell fan and has done a couple of interviews with Mike Grell on his show. Though the show is currently on hiatus, if you are a fan of Green Arrow in general, you should check out the Emerald Archer Podcast, where Ed Moore and his son Nick have covered many versions of the character, both past and present. And at the fun Flowers and Fishnets Podcast, Ryan Daly covers all things Black Canary, and we have a hopeful plan of covering the Longbow Hunters in detail on an episode of his show in the future. We'll put links to all those resources in the show notes for those of you who want to check them out. Also, we'd like to hear from you, so please send us feedback. We'll provide our email address and other ways to contact us at the end of the episode. Also, if you enjoy the show, please consider checking out our other podcast, which is Trekker Talk. It's a fan podcast devoted to the adventures of 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair from the pages of Trekker Comics by creator, writer, and artist Ron Randall. Mike Grell and Ron Randall are our two favorite comic creators. Their stories are filled with adventure and interesting characters, and their art is vibrant and dynamic. So we hope you'll try out Trekker Talk as well, but for now, let's jump into our first issue. The Warlord, first issue special, written and illustrated by Mike Grell, editor Joe Orlando. This special first issue opens with pilot Travis Morgan flying his plane on a secret mission over Russia. His plane has special equipment collecting pictures and other data. However, he soon finds a group of missiles on his trail. He seems able to outmaneuver the missiles, which explode behind him, but he soon realizes his plane is leaking fuel. His only hope to get back to safety is to fly the shortest route over the North Pole in the hopes of reaching Canada. 
As his plane runs out of fuel, he finally sees land again and thinks he's reached the Yukon Territory. He ejects from his plane and is amazed to find that he parachutes into a warm and humid jungle. After hours of hiking, he's confused about why the sun has remained high in the sky instead of beginning to set. He hears strange noises in the distance, and as he crests the top of a hill, he sees a dinosaur preparing to attack a beautiful barbarian woman wielding a sword. Morgan leaps to her defense, but finds his bullets do nothing to stop the creature. As the dinosaur turns on him, the barbarian woman plunges her sword deep into the dinosaur, killing it. She beckons for Morgan to follow her as a troop emerges from the jungle. The two are captured and taken to a towering city in the jungle known as Thera, where they are brought before the king and his high priest, Demos. Demos uses an orb to peer into Morgan's mind. Realizing the invasion into his mind, Morgan pulls his gun and shoots the orb, destroying it. The king is impressed, and Morgan finds himself being treated as a special guest, but Demos is always watching from the shadows. This gives Morgan an opportunity to study and learn about his new surroundings. He has soon mastered the language and learns the beautiful barbarian woman's name is Tara. She was part of a hunting party from Shambhala that strayed too far from their homeland and were attacked by soldiers, and she alone escaped. Through his studies, Morgan also learns that this land is called Skataris, and it's located in the center of the earth, with a flaming ball of gas held at the center by gravity, creating perpetual daylight, making it impossible to tell the passage of time. Morgan's damaged plane wandered into the world of Skataris from an opening at the North Pole. A serving maid overhears the conversation and takes the information to Demos, who then turns her into a snake so that she can't tell anyone else. Demos then sends a group of guards to kill Morgan and Tara in their sleep, but the two easily dispatch their attackers and escape into the jungle, headed for Tara's homeland of Shambhala. Warlord Number 1, The Savage World, written and illustrated by Mike Grell. The story picks up with Travis Morgan and Tara still on their journey to Shambhala. Along the way, the two spend time training as Morgan gets progressively better with a sword. Following a close escape from a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the two hide in trees as a contingent of soldiers escort a group of slaves to the market ball Shazar. Sleeping in a cave that night, Tara arises in a hypnotic trance induced by haunting music. Awakening later in the night, Morgan knows Tara would have never left without her sword. He follows her trail from the cave until he comes upon a satyr playing the hypnotic music from a pan flute. A right hook later, Tara is free from the trance, and the two make their way back to the cave, only to be captured by slave traders. Chained together, our duo is forced on a long march to the slave market. Along the way, Travis Morgan looks for opportunities to use the titanium chain from his military dog tags to slowly cut through Tara's chains. As they approach the slave market, Morgan and Tara take the opportunity to try to escape, and while Tara is able to get away on a horse, after taking down nearly 20 soldiers, Morgan is finally knocked unconscious by the hilt of a sword. Awakening, Morgan finds himself lashed to the branch of a tree as the slave traders ride into the distance. Warlord Number 2, Arena of Death. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Edited by Joe Orlando. Issue Number 2 opens with Morgan still lashed to the branch of a tree as two saber-toothed tigers approach. Morgan kicks his leg, swinging up against the tree and breaking the branch. Falling to the ground, he plants one corner of the branch into the ground and impels the first saber-toothed tiger with the other end of the branch. As the second saber-toothed tiger leaps toward Morgan, it is hit by an arrow from a passing group of soldiers. The leader introduces himself as Drogar the Terrible, and after hearing Morgan's story, invites him to join them as they plan to leave for a nearby port and are also bound for Shambhala. As he boards the ship at the nearby port, Morgan is again knocked unconscious and wakens to find he is now simply the prisoner of a different group of slave traders. Trapped in the hold with the other slaves, Morgan makes a new friend named Machiste, and together the two attempt to escape, but are outnumbered and taken on deck to be hanged. At that moment, Drogar's ship is attacked by pirates, and as they board the ship, Morgan asks them to release him, and he will fight on their side, but they refuse, so he and Machiste instead find themselves fighting alongside Drogar and his men. And thanks for their assistance in defeating the pirates, Drogar decides not to hang Morgan and Machiste and instead sells them to a gladiator training school at the next port. There the two men learn new fighting skills, until one day when Prince Eris arrives to see the gladiators fight in the arena. The female consorts of Prince Eris are allowed to choose the combatants to fight in the arena, and one of them chooses to have Machiste fight Morgan, to see the contrast of having one who is as dark as ebony fight one who is fair with white hair. The two men are evenly matched in the arena, 
but in the end, Morgan overpowers Machiste, but refuses to kill him. When he sees Prince Eris give the thumbs down symbol, Morgan notices he is wearing the watch he gave to Tara as a gift. Enraged, Morgan runs to the barred doors and frees the other prisoners, and together the group of gladiators quickly overtake the arena. Morgan demands to know where Prince Eris got the watch, and learns that he took it from a slave girl he captured before selling her to King Demos of Thera. Morgan is shocked to learn that Demos has risen from high priest to king. He rallies the other gladiators to join him in defeating Demos, and in return he vows to teach them to build new weapons from his world, and promises them all of the gold they can plunder from the city of Thera. Warlord number three, War Gods of Skotaris. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Colors, Carl Gafford. Editor, Joe Orlando. Issue number three opens in a small village with the residents huddled in a small group while surrounded by well-armed soldiers. A herald is reading a proclamation to the villagers, stating that their lands are being claimed in the name of Demos, King of Thera. An arrow shaft rips through the paper, killing the herald, and the other soldiers are all quickly dispatched by Morgan, Machiste, and the other gladiators. Following the battle, Machiste shares with Morgan that the men are becoming restless because they have not yet seen any gold. Morgan loses his temper, telling his friend to pack his gear and leave, but Machiste turns his words back upon him, and Morgan sadly realizes he has come to enjoy the battles. While returning to camp, Morgan sees a unicorn in the distance and chases after it, planning to make it his steed. However, his single-minded focus leaves him oblivious to the lizard men hiding in the trees who take him captive. Morgan finds himself chained in the ruins of a once modern city, knowing that the savages and barbarians he has seen so far could not have built such a city. Noticing the odd shape of a shadow on the ground, Morgan suddenly realizes that he is chained to the fuselage of his plane. It apparently crashed into the ruined city, and the lizard men are worshipping it as a god and plan to sacrifice him. As one of the lizard men taunts Morgan, the ground begins to shake, and a giant snake arises from the ground, killing a lizard man and turning on Morgan. Just then, Machiste rides in, cutting Morgan free. Morgan scrambles to the cockpit of his plane where he finds a case of ammunition, but quickly finds bullets have little effect on the giant snake other than to make it mad. But as the snake looms over Morgan's head, he pulls the release lever on the ejection seat of his plane, sending it rocketing through the snake's skull. Morgan starts to explore one of the buildings in the ruined city, as Machise tells him there are many similar ruined cities in Skataris. The returning lizard men force the two to leave hurriedly, and Morgan turns to leave a room without noticing the map on the wall clearly showing the surface world, including North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and a large continent of land in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. The Warlord Number 4, Duel of the Titans Written and illustrated by Mike Grell Colors Carl Gafford Editor Joe Orlando Issue Number 4 opens in the city of Thera as King Demos taunts his prisoner Tara when a soldier rushes in to announce the city is under attack. Just then, the wall crashes in, killing the soldier. Outside Thera, Morgan has been true to his word, teaching his army of gladiators to build crossbows, catapults, and siege towers, all now outside the walls of Thera. As the battle rages, Demos drags Tara onto a balcony, where he has an odd contraption with two orbs on either side. He begins to read from his book of magic spells, known as the Scrolls of Blood. Suddenly, a giant horned monster appears and begins to destroy the siege towers Morgan and his men are using to break through the walls of Thera. Morgan is carrying a blue duffel bag recovered from his crashed plane as he climbs up one of the crumbling siege towers, but he suddenly finds himself trapped in the giant hands of the horned monster. Aiming his gun, Morgan destroys one of the orbs on the machine near Demos, and the creature evaporates into smoke. Dropping to the ground, Morgan jabs a knife into the large gates of the city entrance and hangs the blue duffel bag on the knife. Running a safe distance, Morgan turns and fires his gun at the bag filled with plastic explosives. The resulting explosion destroys the gates and his army rushes inside, quickly overtaking the city. Trapped inside with no escape, Demos calls for Morgan to fight him to the death. Morgan agrees and swords clash in the shadows inside the Great Hall. But Demos is no match for Morgan, whose blade slashes through the king and former high priest. Outside, Morgan encourages his men to continue to fight for freedom in this land but he and Tara plan to continue their journey to Shambhala. Inside, a growing pool of blood surrounds Demos' Book of Blood, but we finally clearly see the title on the cover, Technical Operations Manual for the Solid Light Hologram Projector, B-100-D, Blood. 
We've heard Mike Grell talk about his love of the works of Edgar Rice Burroughs, and in Warlord, we get a little bit of Tarzan and lots of the world of Pellucidar from Burroughs' works. The stories are fast-paced, and the vistas range from jungles to deserts in these stories. There's great adventure and interesting characters. The action scenes are always exciting. Significant characters we meet in these issues include Travis Morgan, a military pilot who crash lands at the center of the earth, discovering the world of Skitaris. Tari is a beautiful native of the land of Shambhala, who Morgan meets when he first arrives in Skitaris. She trains him in using the sword. Mashist was a fellow captive of slave traders, and along with Morgan was sold to a gladiator school, where the two learned many fighting techniques. Demos is the evil high priest of the land of Thera, who has learned the secrets of Travis Morgan and possesses a magic book of blood. This is an imaginary podcast, which may never have happened. The Short Box Showcase. But then again may have. About a father and daughter. I'm Professor Allen. And I'm Emily. Who came from Ohio and talked about comics. Walking Dead. Tintin. Black Lightning. White Tiger. It tells of their rise to glory, when the great guests were yet to be booked. Let's put it this way, Shogun Warriors wasn't going to win any Eisners. And the great feats of editing, not yet performed. And this is Ultra 7, this is Ultraman Jack, and this is Ultraman Taro, and this is Ultraman Leo, and this Ultra... Of how they spoke at length. This continuity is really the brainchild of nitpicking nerds the world over. But to be fair, the best kind of confession is the Force Confession. And reviewed in brief tales that explore creatively the bounds of a given character's history. Red Sun is wonderful with a very strange ending. Of brilliant creators before their fall from grace. This is the era where Miller is at the height of his creative and artistic powers, and the ability of strong writing to encapsulate and transcend its time. Flash of Two Earths by Gardner Fox. This is an imaginary podcast. Aren't they all? Short Box Showcase is part of the Relatively Geeky family of podcasts. Check us out on the web at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search in iTunes for Relatively Geeky or Short Box Showcase. And remember, we're not experts. We're just family. John Sable Number 1, The Iron Monster. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Colors, Janice Cohan. Letters, Pete Iro. Editor Mike Gold. John Sable, Issue 1, opens with children's author B.B. Flem being interviewed on television about his series of books about leprechauns who live in Central Park in New York City. Leaving the set after his interview, we overhear a news story about an upcoming appearance of the president at the U.N. As the story continues, we see an angry Captain Winters interviewed about safety measures being taken for the president's visit. During his rant, he criticizes the professional bounty hunter John Sable, who wears a battle mask when on the job. We follow B.B. Flynn as he walks through the cold, snowy streets of New York. Arriving at a townhouse, he doesn't just remove his coat, but also a blonde wig, fake mustache, and glasses, revealing himself to be none other than John Sable. Sable goes to his basement, where he has a shooting range to practice his marksmanship. While there, an alarm goes off, announcing intruders in the house. Sable quickly overpowers three armed men. Then he walks outside to a waiting limousine where he finds the president waiting for him. The president tells him they expect an assassination attempt at the upcoming UN meeting. The president wants Sable's protection, but Sable isn't interested. So the president resorts to blackmail, telling him he'd tell the world that beloved children's author B.B. Flynn is in fact bounty hunter and killer John Sable, thus ending his multimillion dollar income. As Sable gets out of the limousine, the president gives him one last piece of information. The suspect assassin is a former acquaintance of John Sable's named Milo Jackson. We then get a flashback of Sable. He knew Jackson both from competing in the 1972 Munich Olympics as well as later serving with him in a mercenary troop where Jackson sold out the location of his squad mates. Sable is brought back to the present by a phone call from his agent, Eden Kendall, who seems more interested in flirting than talking business. Sable's investigation takes him to see gun dealer Mad Maxi, but he's too late. Maxi's been stabbed, but before he dies, he mutters the phrase, Iron Monster. The police arrive and Captain Winters arrests Sable, even though he knows he didn't kill Maxi. Finally getting out of jail the next afternoon, Sable is left with only hours before the president's appearance at the UN. 
Sable finds evidence of bullet holes on the wall behind where the president will appear later that day. He's confident the shots were fired by an iron monster, a rifle that can fire a five-inch group at 1,000 yards. Sable finds evidence that Jackson was in a nearby building where he has left the windows open, but Sable knows he couldn't have fired the bullets from there, but wonders why the windows are open. Sable then turns and realizes the bullets were instead fired from a nearby building that's under construction. Sable races to the upper levels of the construction site, but Jackson is waiting for him and gets the drop on him. As the president starts his speech, Jackson takes aim, waiting the exact moment he wants to fire. As the president takes a dove in hand that he plans to release in the air as a symbol of peace, Jackson starts to pull the trigger. But Sable has freed himself with two knives hidden in his belt and slashes up at Jackson just as the gun fires. The president's eyes widen in surprise as the just-released dove is obliterated by bullets. John Sable Number 2, Death is a Bum Deal Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Colors, Janice Kohan. Letters, Pete Iro. Editor, Mike Gold. The story opens in an alley in New York City. Bum is sleeping under a pile of newspapers. A gun fires. John Sable is picking up groceries at Gold Bloom's, a small corner market. The elderly couple running the market are having a friendly spat about whether or not to get a barcode scanner instead of having to constantly put price stickers on all of the items. Two young men enter the store, brandishing knives and demanding the money from the cash register. Sable quickly takes down the two men and leaves behind a grateful Mr. and Mrs. Goldblum. The next day, Sable arrives at Eden Kendall's office wearing his B.B. Flem disguise. He's there to meet Mike, with a Y, Blackman, who has been illustrating his books for the last two years, and is surprised to learn Mike is a tall, attractive woman, taller, in fact, than he is. Mike pulls out her illustrations to start the meeting, but instead, Flem hands her a sheet of paper with a list of requested changes and abruptly leaves the room. Mike doesn't like being treated that way and grabs her drawings and quickly leaves the room. Outside, she gets a cab and follows Flem to a townhouse. She rings the doorbell and is surprised when someone other than Flem opens the door. She barges in, refusing to believe Flem isn't there. The phone rings and Sable answers it. On the line is a distraught Laura Peters. The bum killed in the alley was her father, Raymond Peters a former engineer, fallen on hard times. She wants Sable to find his killer. When Sable turns back to Mike Blackman, he finds her standing there, holding B.B. Flem's wig and asking, Are you Jekyll or Hyde? Mike gives Sable an earful about his bad manners, and he concedes and apologizes, and the two sit down to review her art. Later, Sable is meeting with Harold, the three-foot-six file clerk at the police station, and he learns there is much more to the case than he realizes. Five bums have been killed in ten days. The same type of gun has been used, but the markings on the bullets don't match, indicating it was a different gun each time, leading the police to think the killings might be part of a new gang initiation. But Sable doesn't think so. Another night in another alley. Undercover cop Phil Walker is disguised as a bum, but instead of catching the killer, he becomes the next victim. Sable is also in the area, and also in disguise. Hearing the shot, he races to the alley, but not in time to catch the killer but he does find a bullet casing. Later, Sable is at the police station. He walks into the ballistics office and hands over the bullet casing he found. Another night in another alley, Sable is again undercover as a bum. A shot rings out from above, hitting Sable in the shoulder. The injured Sable pursues the shooter on foot, cornering him in an alley and dispatching him with a knife. Later, Harold is patching up the bullet wound as Sable examines the gun used by the killer and notices a series of lines that have been cut into the barrel. Sable calls Mr. Goldblum and arranges to meet him at a store that has a barcode scanner, taking along pictures of the bullets from the various killings. After scanning the picture, Harold uses a computer to translate the numerical sequence, which produces a series of numbers and addresses. That night, Sable is sitting in a dark room, wearing his battle mask, when the ballistics officer returns home. It turns out he was a Nazi during World War II who slaughtered prisoners at Auschwitz. It turns out that Raymond Peters was the only real target. The other killings were just intended to mislead the police. Sable has heard enough. A bullet shot rings out, ending the discussion. In these first two issues, we meet our main group of characters. Issue number one, in particular, sets up the situations well. Having these early issues written and drawn by Mike Grell is a treat. A couple of scenes in the first issue of Sable walking in the snow at dusk are particularly nice. The second issue makes good use of shadows to make the scene set in alleys even more suspenseful. 
Significant characters in these issues include John Sable, a former Olympic athlete who we learn was later a mercenary. He also writes children's books under the pseudonym B.B. Flem, and we'll learn more about that later. Eden Kendall is John Sable's agent and seems to be romantically interested in him. Mike Blackman is the illustrator of B.B. Flem's children's books. The two meet for the first time in issue number two. And Captain Josh Winters is a New York police officer who particularly dislikes John Sable. Dinah Lance is a fighter, and her one-woman war is against the czars of crime, the frightened men who dread the blonde bombshell, otherwise known as Black Canary. Writer Robert Kaniger and artist Carmine Infantino created Black Canary in 1947. She debuted as a masked femme fatale that kind of skirted the law, but pretty quickly she evolved into a civic-minded crime fighter. She has mastered multiple martial arts disciplines and unarmed combat forms. Her canary cry, when properly focused, is powerful powerful enough to punch a hole through a wall. Black Canary has, in one form or another, been part of multiple incarnations of the Justice League, the Justice Society, and Birds of Prey. I freaking fell in love with Black Canary, and I'm proud to podcast about her adventures in comics and television. Flowers and Fishnets, a Black Canary podcast. Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters number one. Writer and artist Mike Grell. Assistant, Lorreen Haynes. Color, Julia Lackament, letters Ken Brusnack, and editor Mike Gold. The story opens on the streets of Seattle at night as a prostitute looks for business. Interspersed on the page, we see images of a young Japanese woman. A knife appears and the prostitute dies. The next day, the newspaper tells us she was the 18th victim of the Seattle slasher. Oliver Queen and Dinah Lance are fixing up their new home and business. It's a tall stone building that looks like a castle tower. The bottom floor contains Dinah's flower shop with the sign Sherwood Florist. Moving up in the tower are separate rooms for Dinah and Oliver, as well as a joint bedroom at the top. Suddenly, a young teenage girl crashes through the window of the store. The girl is high on crack cocaine, and Dinah accompanies her to the hospital. When Dinah returns, she tells Oliver she has collected some leads about the cocaine trade in Seattle and plans to investigate it on her own. Hanging a painting of Robin Hood on his wall... Oliver remembers meeting the bowmaster from the classic film on the ship just before he was washed overboard and left to find ways to survive alone on a deserted island, including learning to make his own bows and arrows. Another night on the streets of Seattle. This time, a female police officer is undercover as a prostitute, while two distracted officers watch her from a car. Again, interspersed on the page are images of a young Japanese woman. The two officers in the car realize they've lost sight of her and race into an alley only to find the female officer has become the latest victim of the killer. At a graveyard, a gray-haired man is carrying a shovel and walking toward a coffin and an open grave. Suddenly, a black-and-white arrow rips through his chest and he falls into the open grave. Back at Sherwood Florist, Dinah gives Oliver an early birthday present because she expects to be away investigating the information she collected about the cocaine trade. Oliver opens the package and finds a new green hood for his costume. More practical for Seattle weather, she tells him. Three punks corner an elderly couple in an alley and demand their money. Arrows fly in quick succession, immobilizing each of them as Oliver demands information about the Seattle slasher. They don't know much, but they have heard about a tunnel rat living underground. Oliver finds the man's lair, but is caught off guard as the tunnel rat sets the place on fire. Managing to escape the flames, Oliver tracks the tunnel rat and sees him approaching another prostitute with knife in hand. Oliver races forward, pulling back his bow with a green arrow. At the same corner, a gray-haired man is sitting in a car. Another bow is pulled back, this one with black and white arrows, pulled back by a hooded Japanese woman with a dragon tattoo on her left arm. The tunnel rat grabs the prostitute. Oliver aims his arrow. The Japanese woman pivots and a black and white arrow rips through the tunnel rat. She pivots again and another black and white arrow crashes through the front windshield of the car, killing the gray-haired man. Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, Number 2, Dragon Hunt. Writer and artist, Mike Grell. Assistant, Lorene Haynes. Color, Julia Laquament. Letters, Ken Brusnack. Editor, Mike Gold. It is sunset at the shipyard. One angry man shows up at an office to emphasize how important a business deal is. He makes threats about what will happen if there are any problems with the first shipment. 
Flashback scenes of a young female Japanese archer in training are interspersed on these pages. Once the man storms off, two businessmen remain to discuss their problems. One shares that they are in trouble because the past is catching up with them. He's just learned that five people they know have been killed with black arrows. One of the men leaves to bring in extra help because of the danger. As he walks to his car, he is shot with a black arrow by the Japanese woman with the dragon tattoo. Meanwhile, at the police station, Green Arrow finds he is not welcome, but proceeds to share clues he gathers from the Black Arrows. He knows the arrow is Japanese, made of bamboo with eagle feathers, and lightweight as if for a smaller person, perhaps a woman. The detective acts as if he knew all of that already, but is clearly stumped and asks why senior citizens have been the victims. He can't find anything they have in common. He's checked schools, clubs, and job records, and says none of them were even in the military. Green Arrow says that must be the link, because the victims would have been in their 20s during World War II, and several should have been in service at the time. The detective is still confused by the death of the Tunnel Rat, saying he doesn't fit with the other murders. Green Arrow explains that the Tunnel Rat was the slasher responsible for the serial killings. The detective wonders why one killer would kill another killer. The detective gets more annoyed when an officer comes in to report another homicide, and Green Arrow interrupts to correctly guess that the victim was in his late 60s. No military record? and was killed with a black arrow. Back at his home, Oliver finds a note from Dinah explaining she's going undercover to follow a lead about the cocaine dealer on the waterfront. Oliver sadly sings happy birthday to himself. The next day, Oliver is driving a green Sherwood florist delivery van around the docks when he spots Dinah in the distance entering a bar. He knows she wouldn't like him following her, so instead he goes and checks out the scene of yesterday's murder. He spots the chalk outline of a body that includes the tracing of an arrow. He happens to notice a silhouette of an archer off in the distance, he quickly changes into his Green Arrow outfit and starts to climb up the side of a building where he suspects the archer was heading. Scenes of an older man walking down the street and reading a newspaper are intermixed in the panels. Up on the roof, the Japanese archer is surprised to see Green Arrow, but remains calm. She tells him he doesn't have the eyes of a killer, just as she fires an arrow that sails past him. She then rapidly shoots a special arrow with a razor hook and slices his bowstring. He runs toward her and is knocked over by her bow as we see the older man on the street being pierced by the first arrow that was released. That night, Oliver hears a news report about the brutal murder of a former drug dealer on the docks. Oliver panics, thinking of Dinah, and races off to the bar where he last saw her. Green Arrow ends up eavesdropping on the businessmen from the beginning of the story. He learns the drug dealer was murdered for being a leak in their system, and he now knows where to look for Dinah. He knocks out some guards at the warehouse and finds that one has been shot by a black arrow. We get another flashback of the Japanese woman near the end of her training, where she gains the name Shadow. Inside the warehouse, Dinah is bruised, bloodied, and tied up. A sinister man is trying to get her to say who she is working for. As he prepares to kill her with a knife, he is pierced with a green arrow. Green arrow crashes through a window and shoots a henchman in the leg with another arrow, causing him to fire a gun into some flammable canisters. Green arrow unties Dinah, and as he is carrying her away, another henchman appears with a gun from behind, but before he can shoot them, a black arrow pierces through him. A grateful green arrow sees Shadow watching from the rafters. They all escape the flaming warehouse before it explodes, and Dinah turns to Oliver to say, Sorry, I missed your birthday. Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, number three, Tracking Snow. Writer and artist, Mike Grell. Assistant, Lorraine Haynes. Color, Julia Lacomant. Letters, Ken Brusnack. Editor, Mike Gold. The story opens with Green Arrow waking from a nightmare in a chair next to Dinah's bed in a hospital. She has lost a lot of blood and has broken ribs, but is resting. He goes out to speak with the detective, who wonders why Green Arrow was at the warehouse. The detective said they recovered two types of arrowheads from the blast, and that one of the victims had dog tags that they couldn't link to the military. One theory was that his records had been erased. Next, Oliver Queen stops by a tattoo parlor for information about the dragon tattoo he had seen on the Japanese archer. He learns the dragon is a power symbol, and the design suggests it would be the type used for a servant of the Yakuza. In a flashback, we see Shadow meeting the head of a Yakuza, where she indicates she understands that she owes a debt of honor which she must pay, and that the dragon is a reminder of that debt. Two businessmen are arguing about shipments. One is upset about the explosion at the warehouse and the possibility that the woman who they'd capture may have survived and could cause trouble in the future. We learn that Shadow's father had been sent to the U.S. with $2 million in gold to start a business for the Yakuza. Her father ended up in an American concentration camp for the Japanese during the war. There he was tortured and a small group of military men learned some of his secrets. After the war, they tortured and killed his wife in order to force him to turn over the gold. He later committed suicide. 
The Yakuza are determined to have the military men located and killed, no matter how long it will take. Shadow sends a cryptic message to Green Arrow that leads him to a snowy forested slope of Mount Rainier. He finds Shadow there. She explains that they are after the same man. He heads up the drug ring in the city and is the one who had Dinah captured and is the same man expecting a shipment there on the mountain. She explains she must be the one to slay the man as a matter of honor. Just then a helicopter lands nearby in a clearing. There we learn the head of the drug ring is now working to launder money to support Nicaraguan Contras and may be working with military officials. Shadow is taking aim at her mark when Green Arrow notices a sniper who is about to shoot the same mark. Oliver lands an arrow in the sniper's arm so the rifle misses. A gun and arrow battle follows with the head of the drug ring taking off in a helicopter and getting away. Green Arrow comes across a man who was left behind. He is dumping cocaine in a stream. He explains he is getting rid of evidence before the police arrive. He is planning to scramble down the mountain and doesn't want to haul the laundered cash with him as he doesn't want to risk being caught with it. He tells Green Arrow he should be the one to take the cash. Back in the city, Green Arrow confronts the head of the drug ring. He is recalling how he and his friends got that two million in gold and how he used his share to start his criminal business. He also explains there is no evidence to link him to any of the recent illegal activities. Green Arrow lets him know a witness, Dinah, did survive and will testify. Green Arrow turns to walk away, and as the man pulls a gun out to shoot, a black arrow sails through the window and strikes the man down. Later in the hospital, Dinah is glad to see Oliver and is surprised to hear that today, in the hero business, he got a raise. This has always been our favorite version of Green Arrow. The stories are full of adventure and mystery set in dark streets and alleys. The characters are fully developed and the stories are always poignant. The three issues in this miniseries are gorgeously illustrated by Mike Grell using a variety of techniques and filled with interesting perspectives and points of view. The variety of panel shapes and page layouts are terrific in this book. I particularly like the special close-up headshots of Green Arrow, where the only color visible is the green of his eyes. This is also a great introduction of the character of Shadow, which is a favorite of ours. We thoroughly enjoy the Arrow TV series overall, but sadly their depiction of Shadow is one of the few things that series gets wrong. We would love to see this version of Shadow on screen. If you don't own it, consider picking up the trade paperback or buying the issues digitally from Comixology. They're definitely worth it. Significant characters in this issue include Oliver Queen, a.k.a. Green Arrow, who has just relocated to Seattle as he contemplates his age and future. And Dinah Lance, a.k.a. Black Canary, has moved to Seattle with Oliver, where she has just opened Sherwood Florist. Shadow is a Japanese woman in Bowmaster who was raised and trained by the Yakuza since she was a baby to pay back a debt of honor. We would really like to hear your thoughts about the show, so before we go, we want to provide our contact information. You can reach us at warlordworlds at gmail.com, and you can follow us on Twitter at warlordworlds, and we'll share your comments in future episodes. Also, if you like the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes and Stitcher. It's a great way to help get the show noticed and hopefully attract more listeners. And please consider subscribing to the show so you always know when there's a new episode. You may also enjoy our other podcast, Trek or Talk, about 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair by Ron Randall. In our opinions, Mike Grell and Ron Randall are master storytellers and artists. Thanks for listening, and we hope you will come back next month for another new episode of Warlord Worlds. Warlord Worlds is not affiliated with DC Comics or Mike Rell. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album Royalty Free Instrumental Music for Movies and Websites. Sound effects are taken from the albums Wild Animal Sound Effects, Hollywood Sound Effects Volume 4, Number 1 Sound Effects for Movies, TV, and Websites, Cartoon Sound Effects, and Weapon Sound Effects. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended.